Please stand for the Gospel lesson. The Gospel lesson from Luke chapter 17. This lesson also serves as our sermon text for today. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that have caused people to stumble are bound to come. But woe to anyone through whom they come. It would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. So watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day, and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. The apostle said to the Lord, increase our faith. He replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea, and it will obey you. Suppose one of you has a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Will he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? Won't he rather say, prepare my supper? Get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink. After that, you may eat and drink. Will he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. This is the gospel of our Lord. now in confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father, through Him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day He rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. What's right now in our sermon hymn? It's in the red hymn book, hymn 404.
I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ our Savior, you know these last few weeks as we've been gathering together in God's house, we've had the opportunity to focus on some of the character traits that God wants to see in his people as they live here on this earth. We talked about contentment, that attitude of, of being satisfied with what you have in life and where God has placed you in life and trusting that he will provide for you in all things and protect you no matter what you face. We talked about managing all that God has given to us to his glory and to use it to serve him and serve others. The text that stands before us today also has other character traits God would like to see in us as his people. You know, as you look at all of these different character traits that God wants in his people, one thing becomes painfully obvious. These are all hard to do. What God asks of us is hard. And not only does God ask these traits of us, or expect these traits from us, God asks us to do the hard, difficult things with a cheerful servant heart that doesn't look for recognition or praise, but that simply serves to worship and serve Him. That can be a hard and difficult thing to do. It's very easy for us to become overwhelmed when we look at the hard, difficult tasks that God wants us to do. We have a, a tendency to look at the strength of our faith to try to determine whether or not we're going to be able to do what God asks of us. But that's why we get overwhelmed. If we were to rely solely on the strength of our own faith to do what God asks of us as his people, we would fail Miserable. We're absolutely right to be overwhelmed because the reality is we don't have the strength of faith to do all that God asks us to do. The problem is we live in this world where everybody wants everything to be bigger, faster, stronger. We want everything to be supersized. And we have a tendency to look at faith in the same way. We have that tendency to say, you know what, if I just had a bigger faith or a stronger faith, then I could do what God asks of me. The problem is faith doesn't work that way. Because the ability to do what God asks of you, to display in your life the character traits that God would want you to display, does not come from the strength of your faith. It rather comes from the object of your faith. And since that's the case, the reality is any size faith will do. Because in the end, it isn't about the power of your faith. It's about the power your faith is plugged into. And so in the text before us, Jesus not only encouraged his disciples then, but he encourages us today not to spend our time and energy focusing on the size of faith, or worrying about the strength of faith. But with our faith placed solely in Him as the object of our faith, Jesus simply says, use the faith that you have. That's going to be the theme that we, we look at and study this text under today. Use the faith that you have. Now, as you look at this text, it might seem like it's just random bits of advice that bounce from one topic to the next. It might be hard for you to, at first to, to see that thread that is woven between these pieces of advice that kind of binds them all together. What binds these texts, these pieces of advice together are that these are very hard and difficult things for us to do as God's people. The disciples recognized what a tall task Jesus was laying before them. That's why they interjected his teaching by saying, increase our faith. 
It's as if they were saying, Jesus, we would love to do this, but we don't think we're able to do these things. We need more faith. And so Jesus went on to teach them the reality of faith. Let's listen as, as, as Jesus teaches us as well, as we look at each one of these individually. The, the first hard, difficult thing that, that Jesus wants from his people is that we... We not give offense to others or cause them to stumble and fall as we live our lives. Now, Jesus readily acknowledges in this world there will be sin. Offense will be given and there will be things that, that lead other people into sin. But listen to the warning. He adds a caution. Woe to anyone through whom they come. Jesus doesn't want his followers taking a careless attitude toward sin or giving offense just because the rest of the world around us is doing it. That phrase, little one, could refer to a small child. It could also refer to one who is young in faith. In either case, what God is saying is that we have a responsibility to one another. Our words, our actions, our examples can and do have an influence on others around us. God wants us to be aware of that as we live out our life. How we live our lives matters. Now that can be a hard thing for us. Because we live in a world that says just the opposite. The, the world around us says it doesn't really matter what anyone else thinks. It doesn't matter how your actions affect anyone else. If you're okay with it, just go ahead and do it. Of course, as God's people, we know that it's not what you or I think that determines what's right or wrong. It's what God thinks which determines right or wrong. And under that, God wants us to be constantly vigilant and, and watchful that we live our lives so that we don't offend others or cause others to sin. Parents. That means things like choosing your language carefully so that you aren't leading little ones to use language that would be inappropriate or sinful. That would mean choosing carefully what you watch on TV so that you don't teach children that it's okay to be influenced by, by all the garbage that's available on TV. Christian employees want to make sure they don't give Christ a bad name by being unfaithful in their work. Christian teenagers wouldn't want to lead others to sin at a party by, by in, indulging in, in drinking or drugs or sex before they're married. Long-time Christians, it does matter how you talk at church meetings or about your pastor or church leaders or church matters. <coughs> Especially when you're around someone who would be young in the faith, lest you lead them to think that such gossip or slander is, a, is appropriate or, or, or good for God's people. Right? Those are just some examples of how we might lead others into sin or influence others by our actions. And how important is this? Jesus said it would be better for them to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around their neck than to cause one of these little ones to stumble. That's pretty strong language. It would be better for you to die a slow, agonizingly painful death than to cause someone else to stumble or to fall in their faith. That warning in itself is enough to jolt us into understanding how important this is. The world says it doesn't matter how your actions affect other people. God says it does matter. And he urges us to, to watch ourselves carefully that we don't lead others into sin or cause offense by our sinful actions. That could be a hard thing for us to do. Another hard thing that Jesus mentions is speaking to a brother or sister about their sin when they sin against us. Now, that's difficult on a number of different levels. First of all, you, you just never know how that person is going to react. Talking about sin can be a very, very uncomfortable thing. We don't like people talking to us about sin, so we don't want to have to be the one 
talk to someone else. It can be especially difficult when that sin is against us because we might be trying to get over the hurt that we feel that that sin caused inside of us. It might be hard for us to get past that hurt to be able to forgive that sin and let it go. And were that not enough, Jesus even goes a step further. Even if someone is to sin against you seven times in a day, and they come back and repent, you are to share God's forgiveness with them. That can be a hard and difficult thing to do. Finally, one other hard, difficult thing that that Jesus mentioned, is to simply go about the work that God has given you to do in His name, without looking for any sort of recognition or appreciation, but simply serve God with a, a cheerful servant heart that brings Him glory. Now, that's especially hard for us to do. We like to receive recognition and appreciation. Parents wouldn't mind having their kids recognize the amount of sacrifice a parent goes through to, to, to parent a child and bring them up in the correct way. Spouses want their partner to, to recognize the sacrifices that, that he or, or she is making. And to understand truly that, that everything that's said and done is to put the spouse first ahead of their own needs. We want that bonus at work to reflect the way our employer truly feels about us. And when it isn't what we think it ought to be, then we wonder if we're truly appreciated or not. Even when we work around church, we, we kind of like people to, to notice all of the things that we do. We kind of want that recognition of people to say, wow, what great things you do on behalf of the church. We all have that that, that nature that wants the credit, that wants the appreciation and recognition, wants to be celebrated for the things done and the, the sacrifices that are made, yet God says just the opposite. That His people ought to go about their work simply doing their duty, simply honoring Him by doing what God asked us to do. That can be a hard thing. And we all know how hard all of these things can be because if we admit it to ourselves, we've failed at all of them. I mean, if we truly look at our hearts, don't we have to say there are times that, that we've caused offense to others by our actions? And perhaps led them into sin by the things that we have done? We've been stingy with our forgiveness, unwilling to get past the hurt to lead that person back to a right relationship with God and share the forgiveness that God Himself offers. We've sought the credit. Done things, not just because it glorifies God, but to get the credit for ourselves. This is how we know how hard it is. Because we've all failed to perfectly display these Christian character traits in our lives. And I think that's what makes God's love for us so amazing. So it's so undeserved. That despite all of this, God still sent Jesus into this world to be our Savior. That Jesus came into this world with his eyes focused on us. Doing whatever was necessary to benefit us, no matter how difficult or hard it was for him. Every single time we lay our sin before God and ask His forgiveness, which, let's be honest, is many more than seven times a day, every single time God willingly forgives that sin and dismisses it. That Jesus lived and suffered and died and rose not for His own glory, but because that's what would benefit us eternally. Wow, that really is... God forgives you for all the times you have failed to restrain yourself, for all the times you have failed to rebuke others and forgive them, for all the times that you have sought your glory. He loves you. He cares for you. He's promised that because of His sacrifice, heaven is waiting for you. 
It's that message of grace that strengthens and increases our faith. And it strengthens and increases our faith because it takes our focus off of how terribly weak we are. And it focuses on how incredibly powerful God is. Then even the faith the size of a mustard seed can do powerful things because it isn't us, we who are doing it. It's God working through us. Then it doesn't matter if your faith is supersized or seed-sized. Because faith is much more portal than power. It's much more wall socket than battery. Understand that picture. If we think of our faith like a battery, we're tempted to think that like a small AAA battery, we aren't going to have the juice that we need to do what God asks us. In fact, even if our faith were the size of a car battery, we know that eventually that's going to drain out of juice. Except faith isn't a battery. It's not a power stored up inside of us that just drains out after so much use. Faith is a, a portal. It's a wall socket that connects us to the ever-flowing, omnipotent power of God. And it's when we are connected to that power of God, the power that made this world in six days with God's almighty word. The power that calms seas and quieted storms. The power that raised people from the dead. It's when we're connected to that power that we can go out and be the people God wants us to be. And so Jesus said, don't focus your time and energy worrying about the size of your faith or the strength of your faith. Focus on the object of your faith. And go out and use the faith that you have. Whether that's supersized or seed sized, you can do incredibly powerful things when Jesus is the object of your faith. So increase that faith as you are made mindful of all the powerful things God has done on your behalf. Strengthen that faith as you remember God's promise to use that power to protect you and to watch over you and to work through you as you live as His people. Don't let His tasks seem daunting or overwhelming. Just focus on Jesus and use the faith that you have. Amen.